It is one of the biggest names in computing and has literally written the playbook for the industry. If you own a PC, you probably have their tech inside. Today, we take a look at one of the biggest tech titans in the world. This is the full history of Intel. Intel was founded in 1968 by two guys named Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce. That first name sound familiar? Yeah, that's where Moore's law comes from, which says that transistor density doubles every year. And it's the same law that is causing a bunch of smart people to be worried about when we reach less than one nanometer transistor size. With our current technology and understanding of physics, we can't go smaller and won't be able to keep up with the law. Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce founded Intel with the name NM Electronics, N and M being their initials, and within a few weeks they had changed the name to Intel. Pulled from the first letters of Integrated Electronics, the INT and EL. The first product Intel produced wasn't even a processor. They developed a static RAM chip with almost double the speed as the competition. Intel went on to make a whole host of RAM products that would allow it to break into the market and set itself apart as an electronics manufacturer. Intel's first processor would be called the Intel 4004. Sounding a lot like Error 404, it was a 4-bit processor with 8 pins. Intel then created manufacturing plants all across the world to supply the largely increasing demand. Intel then released the 8008, an 8-bit processor, then the 8080 processors were released as successors with some slight modifications to the design. Then, IBM used Intel's new 8086 processor in their first personal computer. With IBM's computer success, Intel's popularity increased as well. Intel then began focusing on directing their supply chain to become as streamlined as possible. That means they stopped focusing on their DRAM development and instead focused on processor development. They also set out to manufacture the processors in-house instead of contracting other companies. They even went as far to break a contract with a little company called AMD who was manufacturing the current 8080 processors and 8086 processors. Have you ever heard of them? With all of the manufacturing in-house, Intel developed a bunch of new processors without worrying about AMD and other companies having the potential to copy designs. Intel developed and then released the P5 processor, aka the Pentium. The Pentium's original code name was called Operation Bicycle. Why? Because of the two operation pipelines in the architecture. Intel followed up on their initial success with Pentium with a Pentium Pro and Pentium 2 processor. By this point, the Pentium was increasing in performance with each new generation and seeing substantial performance increases in the long run. In 1999, Intel's Pentium processors were in their prime, even to the point where Weird Al Yankovic made a meme in the form of a song, It's All About the Pentiums. Then in 2001, Intel released the first Itanium processor lineup, which was supposed to compete with AMD. However, AMD's competing processors outsold Intel's and would cause these new lineups to be a failure. Intel still makes these, and I didn't even know they still existed, so very interesting here as well. Intel also include a little processor named Xeon, supposed to market to high-end server applications. This processor would become a whole powerhouse that has so many applications from servers to workstations to any type of industrial grade machine. 2002 was the year of hyperthreading, taking one core and seemingly acting as two. The performance benefits in some applications were substantial enough to land hyperthreading a permanent place across all of Intel's lineup. 9,700, <laughs> not to mention secure a spot in today's world as part of almost every single processor release. In the year 2006, Intel released its Core 2 Duo processors as AMD amped up the competition. This was one of the few oddballs that never really lasted or got a successor, but it was a unique processor at the time. In 2008 though, we got one of the names we know today, the Intel Core i-series processors i3, i5, and i7 were released for the first time. This also starts one of the darkest ages in tech, the period of poor performance and little growth. So for almost the next 10 years, Intel would have these processors keep the same number of cores while slightly improving clock speeds and performance. 
Each year, Intel relied on transistor density technology and slight design modifications over including more cores in the processor. And before a bunch of Intel fanboys get mad at me in the comments, this isn't entirely their fault. AMD, their biggest competitor, was struggling to bring something that could even compete. So, Intel had no major motivation to excel beyond its competition. Also in 2008, Intel released its very first Atom processor, basically a low power CPU for laptops and notebooks designed for that market. A large number of the machines that use these are Chromebooks, and they tend to struggle with even writing papers. Also in 2008, Intel started releasing static memory in the form of flash SSDs. These started out as large PCIe devices that could cost thousands of dollars just for 80 to 160 gigabytes worth of storage. Within 10 years, the cost of SSDs by Intel would come down substantially while increasing the amount of storage. In 2008, Intel created a product called the Intel Compute Stick a computer in a USB drive that allowed for users to turn their TV into a computer by just plugging it in. This wasn't a powerful stick and it didn't have a dedicated GPU. It just opened up a lot larger markets for potential computer users by Intel. In 2010, Intel moved this graphics from the Northbridge motherboard chip to the same die as the CPU, meaning that motherboards no longer handle graphics in the absence of a discrete GPU. Intel was also rumored to be working on a new dedicated GPU called Project Larrabee, but no product release ever came of it and it kind of faded away. We touched earlier about Intel's Project Larrabee, supposed to be a dedicated graphics card by Intel, but that never actually came into a real product. So Intel made something else called the Xeon Phi coprocessor, which was basically a bunch of small x86 processors packed into a single PCIe card. These processors are, as I said, based on the x86 instruction set, and they allow for more CPU heavy applications to run than it would normally on a GPU. Also, Intel makes a horde of networking products, wireless and ethernet adapters that are used in both Intel and AMD motherboards. Chances are, when you're watching this video right now, either your ethernet or your wireless adapter are made by Intel. So around 2014, we got some of the technology we have today. Intel's favorite manufacturing technology, 14 nanometers. That's right, Intel released their newest processor with this manufacturing process, six years after it was originally developed. For every new processor, they just add a plus to the process. Now that statement isn't entirely true. Intel did release a 10 nanometer processor in 2018 and a few select processors since but that is the few examples of this process in actual production we have seen so far. In early 2017, Intel announced a new memory product called Optane, a high performance static memory product allowing for super fast read and write speeds. One of the worst parts, however, is that the price per gigabyte was rather high. Yes, it was fast, but it also discouraged some potential buyers. Optane also had some questionable iffy marketing. Some companies advertised it as what it was supposed to be, SSDs allowing for boosting hard drives, but some companies chose to advertise it as actual RAM, which it's not. While yes, having fast storage devices as a cache between your hard drive and CPU does make a substantial difference, it does not serve as RAM. In 2017, something big happened for Intel. Not that they released a new product or even a stellar product, Actually, if we compare the top SKU first i7, the 975, to the 7700K from that year, the 7700K is just 65% better in performance than that predecessor. It took almost nine years to increase the performance by 65% for a top tier CPU for desktop consumers. What was game changing in 2017, however, was AMD offered competition again for the first time in multiple years. AMD released the first gen Ryzen chips and they brought AMD back from a minor concern of Intel to one of the forefront of its operations. With AMD's Ryzen processors, we saw for the first time in nine years, Intel released a product with more cores. A product release that changed Intel from releasing quad cores releasing hex cores and so on in future generations. No matter if you are an Intel fan or an AMD fan, Ryzen forced Intel 
to release some more powerful chips and benefited everyone in the process. Since this video isn't about AMD, just keep in mind for the remainder of this video, AMD continues to offer substantial competition to Intel and encourage them to innovate. After the release of Ryzen, Intel released its very first mainstream 6-core processor, dubbed the 8700K. With hyperthreading, the processor was just above anything AMD could offer in terms of performance, at least for gaming. With competition, Intel continued to increase the core count in reaction to AMD. Also, we got one of the biggest crossover events in PC history with Team Intel and AMD teaming up together on a new Nook, or Intel's version of the next unit of compute. These are basically super small computers. There was also not enough room to have a discrete GPU. We all know that Intel's current integrated graphics suck. So previous versions of the Nook performed very poorly with these integrated graphics. Using AMD's Vega graphics, however, they were able to include a CPU and a GPU in one package. This meant a much higher performing gaming PC, and it was very successful, low power and in a very low form factor. This year, Intel produced an entire PC in the form of a PCIe X16 card called Intel Element. That connects to a dock for, with extended I.O. and these are used in small form factor PCs where space is at an ultra premium. This product is designed for Intel's Nook products and took the place of AMD besides Intel from their Vega architecture. This allowed for any GPU to work with their Intel Nooks and once again parting ways we then got the 9th gen processors and for the first time a premium chip on a desktop socket the first i9. The i9 was on the desktop socket and was an 8-core processor designed to compete with AMD's 8-core offerings. Now yes, Intel still has the lead in gaming, which as every game moves away from relying on just one core, Intel slowly loses that title. Having one super overclocked, turbo boosted, extreme frequency range, high speed processor core is not going to be the best at gaming at some point in the near future. Now, Intel has come full circle with their newest CPU, the 10900K, which I don't even know how to pronounce. AMD struggled a lot back in 2009 through 2017 with power consumption and heat. Now, we look at the aging 14 nanometer plus 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 technology, and Intel's new i9s are pulling more power when unlocked than AMD's high end Threadripper 300 watts and 300 watts. With more than six times the number of cores, the Threadripper just has a little performance benefit there. Now in all seriousness, both of these are companies and they just both want money. So as Intel struggles to compete, AMD will lay off the gas. We can only hope that Intel figures out its manufacturing technology before we have another seven year gap in the amount of cores that we have on the desktop process. One final thing to point out before we go, it took Intel nine years to increase the performance of its top end desktop CPU by 65% with no competition. But in the last three years, it has increased its raw multi-threaded performance by 100%. That really shows how having competition will do a lot for consumers and giving us improved products. Thank you for joining me and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. More of these will be coming soon and let me know what you want to see the history of next.